Can we give it up for Ben Fitzgerald as he comes to the stage? Thanks, thanks. Hey guys, how are you? Praise the Lord. Does anybody love Jesus here? That's amazing. I just have to ask my amazing team over there to do one favor for me. I need my phone. I forgot my phone. And I've, I've been repenting so much now that I'm leaving it behind. Guys, would you do me a favor and would you turn to somebody next to you that you don't recognize and tell them, my name is so-and-so and Jesus loves you. Would you do that for me? All across this arena. Look for someone you've never met. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right. <laughs> this is my last sermon to you in Awakening Australia. And uh, I'm not bummed about that at all because we have so many people filled with Jesus. But this is my most important message. We worked all year for messages like this. I don't want you to hear me tonight. I want you to hear straight from the mouth of the Lord Jesus. This sermon is to two groups of people, actually three. It's to Christians, it's to backslidden Christians, and it's to non-believers yet, or as I like to say, pre-believers. And I want to be very transparent with you. The people that brought you here tonight did not bring you just so you can watch a bunch of crazy Christians wave at the air. They brought you here because the God that they love, that we love, has transformed their life. And I want to talk to you about how He transformed mine tonight. But first of all, I want to pray because I see this as a great honor and I'm a vessel to speak to you. And the Word of God speaks clearer than I could ever speak. So Father, I pray and we pray that you would speak the truth to every heart seated here, those who are watching online. Let it be clear. Let it be a message that comes to the depth of who we are. Whether we know God or we don't, speak the truth to our hearts, God. And even if you're a pre-believer or non-believer, one thing you could agree with, you could agree with this prayer. You could say this maybe, God, if you are real, speak to me tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said Amen. Would you open your Bibles? And if you don't have a Bible, the person that brought you here might have one that you can look at to the book of John chapter 14. John 14. A very famous verse here. And uh, then I want to tell you a bit about how my life changed because the man you're looking at was an eight-year-old porn addicted man, extremely broken. You're going to hear a bit about that tonight. I was the furthest thing from a Jesus person that you could ever meet. In fact, I used to threaten to punch Jesus' people in the face. And uh, I'm, I'll just talk to you about that in a minute. But before I explain that, I'll talk about someone who's much kinder than I was. His name's Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 6. This is a very famous Bible verse. Even some people who don't know God know this verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God, the Father God, except through me. I want to read that again slowly. Jesus said this enigmatic statement. See, some people knew about the truth. They said they had a truth. They said they had a way. But he qualified a statement, which is so arrogant if it's wrong, by saying, I am the truth. And he says that again like this. Jesus said to him, and probably much more gentle than I'm explaining it, just calmly probably just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Meaning that no one person, no existent person, whether in India, Australia, the United States, every human alive can connect truly to God, he was saying, through him. And why would he make a statement like that? You know, many of you here tonight actually already talk about Jesus if you're a non-believer. If, you, if you're like, I'm an atheist, I don't even believe in God. You talk about Him all the time. I hear it every day. When I go get a coffee in Australia, when I'm traveling around the world, I hear people say Jesus all the time. They're sitting in the cafe and they're like, Jesus Christ, I ordered my coffee five minutes ago. They talk about Jesus all the time. 
even non-believers. I was talking to a guy who plays for the Brisbane Lions at the airport in Perth a few months ago, and he said the same thing, Jesus Christ. I said, exactly, that's what it's all about. Sometimes when people say it to me, I turn around and go, you know him too. And they're like, huh, what are you talking about? I kind of have a quick chat to them. And so I found it interesting several years ago when I heard all these people say, oh, Jesus Christ, they dropped their wallet, lose their wallet, Jesus Christ. I started thinking about that. I was like, how come we don't say Buddha? How come we don't say Muhammad? How come we don't say anybody else? How come when I watch movies from Hollywood, everybody talks about this dude called Jesus Christ? Why do they mock his name? Perhaps there's something out there that wants us to think that he's just some meager, that this name has no truth to it, that it's just some fake thing, that it's just some historic figure, a guy with a beard. No, no, no. I think there's a a agenda that spiritually is behind us saying Jesus as if he's just some other person. Because I used to say that all the time. I used to think he's just another person, but he's not another person. Do you know every religion on the planet talked about Jesus, except Buddhism. They were 500 years before Jesus, but even Siddhartha, whose name, that's the real name of Buddha, when his disciples who were around him, and by the way, Siddhartha Buddha was very skinny. I don't know what happened to him, but over the years, they molded him into a fat statue. I don't know how it happened, but he was very skinny. I don't know how, but they got him to this big thing, and he was a young man, and all these disciples of the Buddha, they said, tell us, tell us what's going to happen when you die. And he made this statement. He said, I am not the way. He made that statement. Those words, the way. He said, I'm not the way. He could feel his humanness. He could feel his sin. He could feel he was broken. He could feel there was something in his life that wasn't perfect. But this man who entered the hallways of eternity 2,000 years ago, and by the way, it's 2024 AD, after his death, His life literally flipped the whole script of human time. He wasn't just a normal man. And that's why he had the confidence to say to the earth, to our hearts, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when I grew up as a kid, guys, I didn't grow up some pretty Christian. As I said, when I was an eight-year-old kid, actually it was before that, when I was six, my dad, he was a golf professional, used to play professional golf, and My dad was a beautiful, very kind man. Everybody knew him. He's just so friendly. And um, everyone used to come around. They love my dad. Uber generous. Such a good guy. And uh, just honest all the time, you know. And he was a golf pro. And he felt, him and my mom, they felt my dad needed to move to Africa. He wanted to give up professional golf where you make pretty good money and move to Africa to be a missionary to work with a guy called Reinhard Bonnke. And if if you're not a believer or you don't know who that is, That's a guy who in Christian circles would be pretty well known for talking about Jesus, particularly in the continent of Africa. And so my dad gave that up and he went to Africa, but he rang my mom after three weeks or two and a half weeks. He had really, really serious sleep deprivation and and he couldn't sleep and he was starting to hallucinate a bit. And and my mom said, well, get people to pray for you. And it, it just didn't go well. And she said, come back to Australia. So he came back to Geelong, Australia. That's where I'm from, little old Geelong. We call it the city of dreams when you're from Geelong. And uh, definitely wasn't the city of dreams last Saturday when they lost to Brisbane. But anyway, back to the point. (laughs) So in Geelong, my dad arrived back at my house, but he was different. This gentle, loving father was on edge all the time. And then on my brother's first birthday, I'll never forget it because it's kind of emblazed in my mind. You have those things too, right? You have things that happen to you sometimes You had terrible things. There's people in this crowd who were sexually abused. And the weight and the stain of that sits in your soul. There's people here, or you did something bad. You might have cheated on your girlfriend, whatever, and you, for some reason, you just carry this weight of guilt. And I had this very strange scenario happen with my dad where it was kind of in bronze into my thoughts. I was holding my brother, one-year-old. We had a birthday cake. And next minute, my dad, my peaceful, gentle, genuine father, got those old telephones that some of you Gen Zers or Alphas or whatever you are now, I don't even, I can't keep up with what gen you are. You get a new name every few weeks, it feels like. He picked up one of these phones. You used to have to ring with your finger. Do you remember them? Who remembers what CDs were? 
<laughs> mini disc, you know, all these things. Some people are like, what's a CD? I heard a Gen Z kid being interviewed the other day, and he was like, do you know what a CD player is? He's like, bro, what's a CD player, man? Like, he didn't even believe it was real. And um, so anyway, my dad picked this phone up, huge t- uh, uh, phone with your finger, and he smashed the front window. And just, and my dad would never do that. Out of instinct, I picked up my brother, ran across the road, and then I see the ambulance come probably 30 minutes later, and they take my father, and they had to, you know, they had to tranquilize him type thing, fill him with lithium, suppress him, push him down. And it was sadly, they had to take him to a mental institution. That night, they diagnosed my father with paranoid schizophrenia. They said, he's schizophrenic. He'll have this his whole life. Nothing will ever change. And they put him on very heavy drugs. And back then, they didn't really know how to treat things. So the drugs made my father, who was a very a golfer, fit guy, a loving man, they made him extremely lethargic. So he just sat at the kitchen table and began to read the Bible. And this happened for years. And my faithful mother, um, little bitty woman, powerful, you know, little bitty woman, tall as a drink of water. But if you go near her and you'd cross her son or cross her family, she, she'll pray against you until, you know, something happens. Like, I would rather have the mafia against me than my praying mother. And so <laughs> she was just on fire and she was like, God's going to heal your dad. And she would tell me that as a boy every night. But because my last name is Fitzgerald, I arrived at school and the students found out my dad was a psycho. They found out he was schizophrenic. And so they started going, Fitz the skits, Fitz the skits. And they got the whole class involved, people involved. And so I became this little weird, in the corner kid, awkward, didn't want to go to school, would skip school addicted because I found pornography at eight years of age when all these students hated me and I became this weird person. I found porn and I didn't have a sex drive at eight, but the pages and the women for some reason, because I hated school. And then I'd come home to my dad and sadly, my peaceful, loving dad would have this thing they call an outburst, a relapse. And so sometimes he would just snap again. So I was afraid of him and then I was afraid of school. And so I disappeared into this kind of depth of sin where I was stuck as an eight-year-old watching and reading these pornographic magazines, not for the sexual content. I had no sex drive. An eight-year-old doesn't have anything like that inside them, but I needed to be comforted. I would read them and feel like that is my friend. I had no other friends. So I was the awkward kid and that continued. And then one day, After many, many years of prayer, my mom would say to me, Ben, I believe God is going to heal your dad. There's going to be a miracle that happens. His mind is going to become normal again. And she would pray with me. And I believed it. As a kid, I believed it, not naively. I believed it because I know God is real. And some of you might be thinking, no, God isn't real. You You should know the things that I've been through. I haven't even told you half my testimony. There's stuff where later on, in my, in my story, old men got into my life and tried to sexually abuse me. There was crazy bad things that began to happen. But God sovereignly protected me. But there was one thing that happened that really changed my life. And this is what it was. At 10 years of age, my mom said, we're going to take you, your brother, and your sister away for one night only. See, my mom was my dad's personal carer, really. So we never left the house. Can you imagine being a kid? You cannot leave the house ever for four and a half years. And you're nine, 10, and you never go on a holiday. Every one of your friends or people at school go on holidays, but we couldn't leave because he was volatile. Anything could happen. But my mom decided it's been too long, four and a half years. We have to take the kids away for some holiday. But my dad said, I'm not coming. Mom said, just one night, we we went to this place in, in Victoria called Queenscliff. And my dad gave me this hand fishing reel. You know, the thing you give kids where they, not a full rod, just a little hand reel. But he grabbed me and he pulled me to the kitchen table. And he said this, he said, Ben, and he burst into tears. He broke down, he grabbed me. He said, I love you. I love you, Ben. And I was like, I love you too, dad, you know. And, And he gave me a hand fishing reel and he said, catch me a fish. Catch me a fish. And so my mom took us down. We got a little tent right near Queenscliff Beach. I took that little fishing reel, I chucked it in, I kid you not, I I think it was God. Within five minutes, I had a fish. 
I pulled that thing up and I wanted to sleep with it in the tent. Mum wouldn't let me sleep with it. I was so happy that I got a fish. I, she wrapped it in newspaper and I wanted to sleep with the fish. The next morning we drive back to dad, back to the house, and I was the first one out of the car and I take the fish and I ran inside. Dad! I went to the kitchen where he sat, not there. Dad! Holding the fish, Dad! And I just kept yelling, Dad! I thought, okay, he's not here, he must be in his bedroom. It was only like nine in the morning. So I went in, Dad! And he was, sure enough, he was there, he was asleep. I said, Dad! Dad! No answer. And I went, Dad! It's dead silent. I dropped the fish, and I went over to him, and I touched his head, and it was ice cold. And I jumped, and I felt, I kid you not, and some of you who don't even believe in God, you know this to be the truth, because you can be walking down a dark alley, and for some reason, you turn, and you felt somebody was 20 meters behind you. How did you know that? How did you know something was beyond your body? I would propose to you, you have more than what's inside this flesh. There's something on the inside of you. There's a spirit, there's a soul. And I met people who were in the war, who had their legs blown off, and they had just as much character, just as much charisma and spirit, even with half their anatomy gone. You are more than a body. You have something else inside. And so when I touched my dad, I felt fear jump in me. I mean serious fear. And I ran outside, I said, Mom, Mom, Dad's dead. He's dead. And she said, don't say that. I said, he is dead. And I screamed, I ran off. The police found me two hours later. We found out that night my father had taken 70 sleeping tablets and committed suicide. And because I found him dead, it just shattered me all the years of teasing, the pornography. I don't know what it did in me, but just something happened. And here's what I say, when you mix sin which all of us have. We're going to see it in a second what that is. Sin doesn't mean, oh, naughty boy. God's not there with a big rod trying to point out everybody's sins. God isn't some cosmic buzzkill trying to steal your joy, trying to show you you're such a bad person. No, God died for us. He, he could actually feel your pain, the sin that you go through. He could sense how bad it is, how destructive it is. But when you mix sin with that kind of grief, it's a volatile cocktail. You see that in Australia sometimes. You've got sin, and then some kid's dad left when he was 14, and now he's just a guy. Every weekend he wants to get to the club, get cut full of drinks, and then bang, he wants to hurt someone. Because sin and grief, they're a terrible mix. And I became a terrible, terrible man. And some of you tonight are like, he looks so lovely. He looks like Jesus kind of, you know. And uh, someone in the Singapore airport told me that. She goes, you look like Jesus. I had that little thing in me. I wanted to be like, hello, you know, Domine Patsui Fili, Spiritu Sai. I said, no, I said, no. I said, that's the whole point. I want to look like Jesus. But she said, uh, but for me, when I found my dad's suicide, I flipped. I became violent, aggressive. And then by the age of 14, I had to go through several different schools. My poor mother, she had to ring all the schools. Please give him another chance. Please give him a chance. I'd grab apples and stuff and just pearl them at people's heads and I was just angry, just full of anger. And I ended up leading a rally, actually, at 14 years old. I got involved in as much bold, corrupt things as I could. And they put me on the front page of the, the Geelong Advertiser at 14, yelling at everybody. And I became so volatile that they kicked me out of school. And so now, I'm out of school, I'm filled with grief, I'm filled with sin, and I only had one comfort back then. Remember what it was? Porn. It was women, but it went from women on the page to women in real life. And so I became ultra corrupt, like just using people, addicted, just bad. And I even went to work. I started an apprenticeship. And even in the apprenticeship, I think about just lust all the time. I was given over to darkness. But what happened in that process was gradually, just further and further down the road, year by year, month by month, I became more and more angry, more and more broken in the sense of like sad, nothing would fill me. I'd have the best looking women, it wouldn't fill me. I'd, I'd end up putting cocaine up my nose, it wouldn't fill me. And so then I got involved with these older men. I felt like I always was sort of hanging out with people who are like 15 years older than me, men. I guess I was looking for a surrogate father, for a father figure, someone to guide me that I didn't have. And these older men, they were more corrupt than me. And so they handed me ecstasy and they said, what we want you to do 
is we want you to deal drugs. And we want you to do all this sort of stuff. And, and uh, we, we used to play pool back in the day, like eight ball pool. And I'd play five, six hours a day. And I tried to be a professional at that and just tried to do something to feel significant. And then at night, I would deal drugs and do all this dark stuff. But all the while, I'd, I'd just have another girl come into my life and I'd destroy her life. Because inwardly, I was destroyed. And some of you know exactly what that, that's like. You might not be a drug dealer per se like I was a small time one. I wasn't a big time one. But you might not be as sinful on the outside, but you might be a work addict. Your wife is missing you. Your heart's so hard. She goes to kiss you and you just shrug her off. But you just want to get back to the office, back into this thing that you have made a God to you to feel significant, to fill the emptiness of what sin and all the pain of life has created. And I had that so dark and so deeply. And I became so evil. I got into things I won't even speak from this pulpit. It's not worth it. It's not worth telling you about. But at the age of 20, while I was dealing ecstasy, I had this experience, an encounter with my mom. Now, a lot of people in this place, you know exactly what I said before when I said, I'd rather have the mafia than a praying mom against me. Praying moms are like bulldogs with a bone. They don't look like bulldogs. They look like daffodils. But if you start going away from God, they will get every intercessor and every Christian person, every flag waving, every shofar blowing, oil anointing person they can find and start to say, pray for my son. Pray for my daughter. And I didn't want to go within 10 foot of a church. I didn't want to go anywhere near a Christian. So what I would do, I was being clever and tricky. I would hide ecstasy at my mom's house. So in case the police came to my house, they wouldn't bust me. They'd bust my little mom. See how dark I was? See how sinful that is? How selfish that is? Do you think God made us to operate that way? Do you think God made the world to have a one, point, or a one in every 2.5 marriage divorce rate? Do you think God made us to, to have this city as the, the capital of OnlyFans, where all these girls give their body away for money? Do you think God made us to be so fractured, so destroyed, that we have to get the hotted up car, the best car, and it's just the sound of vroom that makes us feel like we're a man. Oh, I've paid a hundred grand for this piece of plastic. That's how valuable I am. That's how I used to think. I used to just determine my value by the next girl, how much money I had, and so I was so evil. And so I went to my mom's house one day, and my little bitty mama got in front of me with my brother in the hallway. She knew what I was doing at the house. I'd visit once every month or so and hide these drugs. And she got in front of me and she said this. She, she goes, Ben, she goes, listen to me. And I knew these criminals, bad criminals. Like, they are violent. And I love them, actually, because God can change any of them. But I knew these violent people. When I was around them, they bothered me a bit. I was a bit like, oh, I could see if I pushed the wrong button, that'd be bad. She was 10 times more terrifying to me than them. She got in front of me, and it's like all the evil inside me wanted to kick against her. Like, I was like, just get away from her. Something in me. Get away from this woman. Get away. And I'm like, I can't. This is the house I grew up in. I can't get away. I was stuck in the hallway. And some of you can relate to this, right? Someone comes to you and says, hey, would you like to do some yoga with me? That would be amazing. Oh, yeah, let's do Let's breathe in. <sighs> let's breathe out. We all want to feel better spiritually. Oh, would you like to do this? Take these crystals. Okay, I'll rub the crystals wherever you want to rub them. I'll, give me the crystal. What do I do with that? I'll put lemon juice through my eyes if I can get spiritual. We are all like that. And then someone says to you, Jesus loves you. Like, bro, don't, don't tell me about religion. Why? How come everybody can tell you about Reiki and spiritual meditation and crossing your legs and putting your leg over your head? But as soon as someone says, Jesus, have you noticed that? Perhaps there's a reason he said, I am the way. I am the truth. Because all of us, if we've fallen into sin, have chosen to live our way. We've chosen to adopt our truth, which isn't really the truth. Because the truth in our way gets us into deep trouble, into deep brokenness. And so my mom got in front of me that night. And she said, Ben, look at me. And I was like, get out, of the, get out of the way. And then my brother got involved. Don't talk to mom like that. I threatened him. And actually, my brother, my precious brother and my mother are both here tonight listening to what I'm saying. And she said this. She said, Ben, God loves you. God has a plan for you. God sees you. 
She said, you know God is real. And she goes, and I am praying for you. I'm praying that you would open your heart to Jesus. And something in me went vicious. I had a bottle of V with me and I smashed it against the wall and I just lost it screaming and I left the house in fear. Something spiritually was just reacting inside me. Again, when people used to tell me when we would all deal drugs, can I do a Reiki thing on you? I had zero reaction, but this was different. And so then three weeks later, I was in a nightclub doing what I did every Saturday, Friday. My girlfriend worked in the nightclub and my girlfriend uh, could see that I just was troubled. And for three, four weeks, I was just troubled after this time. And I didn't know really that my mom and my grandma, they were praying every day for me to be saved. They were praying every day that my eyes would be open and that the broken life I was living, I would wake from that slumber. And some of you, as I said, you might not be a porn addict, a drug addict, but you might cheat on your wife. You might have done something that is so sinful. It doesn't matter how bad it was. It doesn't matter how tiny it was. All sin is sin. All darkness is darkness. I have people tell me I'm a good person. And sometimes I answer, by whose standard? By whose determination? Are we really, really good? Well, I don't do much. I just tease people occasionally. Do you know one of the number one reasons for suicide is online teasing? So if I call someone a fat whatever and give them some kind of terrible, disgusting comment, is it, oh, it's not that bad. It's just a slang statement. It's just a knockdown statement. And then I find out they hung themselves. It actually killed a human being. It's as serious as murder then, isn't it? You see, we can't determine what's good. Only the person that created us can determine good. Only the person that sets the tone of what is evil and what is good can really set the tone for us but we choose our own way. And three weeks later in that nightclub, I woke up from the slumber of sin. And here's what happened to me. And I'm gonna be a bit graphic, okay? Is you're all right with this? All right. I was there and I saw everybody dancing. 3.45, four in the morning. Just, you know, all that music, you know how it is. I was there in that moment. It was so, so dark. And all of a sudden, I saw them, I saw me, I saw some of you, I saw the world clearly. Thoughts began to rush through my head. Why is that beautiful girl going home with that guy? I know that guy. That guy cheats on every woman he, he has. That guy, could, he'll probably hit her. Why is she giving her body all of her worth and she's gonna go home with that guy? She doesn't even know him, he could be a rapist. Why does that guy have to snort up his nose to feel good? And I started to think of kids. Kids are always happy. We weren't made this way is what I'm saying. And it dawned on me, my eyes are open. Why are we here at four in the morning? Why are we seeking and reaching out? Why is this longing so deep? And I got it. We are searching to feel valuable. I felt that. I'm like, look at them all. They're searching to feel something. They want to feel something. And then it dawned on me. The mirror flipped to my life. And then I went, and I am in here. What am I doing here? I don't know these people. What are these drugs in my hand? And I just literally looked at them. My girlfriend worked at the bar. And I looked at her. And I threw them all out. And I went to her. I said, Alina, this is wrong. She goes, what do you mean it's wrong? She's trying to pour drinks. What do you mean? What do you mean it's wrong? I said, this. It's fake. We're trying to puff ourselves up. Look at everybody. It's fake. This isn't what we were made for. Why are we here? Why are we so attracted to emptiness? The book of Isaiah explains it. 55 verse 2. You can read it here on the screen. Isaiah 55 2 says this. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy Listen to me carefully and eat what is good and let your soul, let that longing inside delight itself in the abundance of God. But I was this guy, I was the one spending my life, giving myself to brokenness, to witchcraft, to sin, to manipulation, to great, great emptiness. And so I left the nightclub, I went home, and I did what I did every night. I closed all the windows, everything. I hated natural light. I used to wake up at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I hated light and I used to take cold showers. Something in me hated myself. 
I can relate to some of you girls who've cut yourself. I can relate to you. I felt the same way. I used to stare in the mirror at three in the morning, four in the morning, coming home from nightclubs, and, I, and I'd speak to myself, I hate you. I used to hate my life. But I sat at my house at 4.15 in the morning. I lit a cigarette up, and just with the light of the cigarette in the whole pitch black room, on the left-hand side of my room, and you can doubt this if you want, but I can tell you the fruit of these two men, the man who's talking to you, the man who's standing in front of you is not lying to you about the difference between who I was and who I am now. The fruit speaks for itself because with that cigarette in my hand, this feeling came into the left side of the, my lounge room. And all of a sudden, inside me, I hear loudly a male voice deeper than mine, louder than mine, and it said this, like this, Ben, like that, and it went thundering through me like that went right through me. Now, you know your subconscious voice? You're driving home. I forgot to get milk. You don't say it out loud, do you? Your conscience talks to you. Your thoughts talk to you. In fact, they say we speak in 400 words a minute. You're speaking 400 things to yourself at once. You're hearing your subconscious and conscious mind continually. And everybody agrees with that from every religion, from every walk of life, because we do have an inward conscience. This wasn't my conscience. It was a different voice. And Ben, like that, through me. And then he said this, he said, I love you, I love you, and I knew because it was going through me like, kind of like a mixture of fear and like butter, like peace, but fear, and with the cigarette, and, and my first thought was, this is my actual first thought, I wasn't like, wow, you're Jesus, my first thought was this, I was like, is this Jesus? And then my second thought was, how can you be speaking into a prostitute addicted drug dealer? How could you be inside me? But the Bible says, and Daniel mentioned it before, the earth is God's and all the fullness that dwells in it, every human he made. So you came right out of God's heart. You are valuable. You are important to him. And God can speak straight into your heart tonight like he spoke into mine. He sees you. He knows you. He knows if you have a cigarette in your hand or if you're a woman who constantly throws your food up because you hate the way you look or someone who used to go to church and backslid into the world. He knows you. And he doesn't just know you. He cares enough to die for you. He's not a dead religious figure. He is the reason for life. And that's why he said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so I felt Jesus speak to me. And I was like, oh no, oh God. And I knew I was sinful. And I wanted to start saying stuff, but I couldn't. He kept talking in my heart. I could hear him loudly speak to me. Ben, will you follow me? Will you come to me? Will you be my, my disciple? Will you give your life to me? And then he started talking to me about a man in the Bible called Paul. And I didn't know much about that man. But anyway, after 45 minutes or so of this experience, and I'm like, you know, I think at the end of it, I was really like, I need to light up a whole packet. I didn't know what to do. But I felt this cleansing had washed me. And I hadn't even prayed a special prayer. I had simply heard the voice of Jesus. My girlfriend came home at five, and I was standing like this. And I think she thought when she looked at me, he took something really bad. But I said, Alina, Alina, I said, I need to tell you something. And she said, what? I said, I'm sorry. She never heard me say sorry. She heard excuses. She heard this guy who she found cheating on her and then telling her that was your fault. She heard manipulation. She heard aggression. She never heard love because I was in sin. And you can't be a half sinner and half hateful. So you can't be half hateful and half kind. Your good little deeds, you mowing your grandpa's lawn, doesn't stop the porn that you watch every day. You doing some kind deed, giving World Vision a hundred bucks, doesn't stop the fact that you gossip against all your workmates and put them down all day. Sin is inside us. We were born with it. But I said to her, because something had changed in me, I said, I'm sorry. And she goes, what happened to you? And I said, Jesus spoke to me. And, she, and then she goes, are you okay? I said, I, I don't know, but God spoke to me. And so right after this, I got a little bitty Gideon's Bible. They're the ones you find at hotels. 
And I started reading it four hours a day, and people would come to my house to get ecstasy pills, and I'd say, sit down for a second, and I'd give them the pills and the gospel, same day. I would sit them down, say, here's a 10-pack of tablets, and I'd say, just believe me, I was being sanctified. I was in a process. Don't you do this. Don't answer the altar call tonight and go, okay, I'll come forward, and I'll just deal for three more months. No, 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 my friend. I was in a process. But I used to bring them around, and I'd say, listen to this, bro. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you know what that means? They're like, "Uh, no, who's the Lord? I'm like, it's Jesus. And, you know, the Lord, I shall not want. We don't need those ecstasy tablets anymore. He's like, I just paid 300 bucks for them. I'm like, you don't need them. And so they they stopped coming. They stopped coming to me. They thought, this guy's gone really crazy. But guess what happened? My girlfriend got saved. My best friend got saved. All my drug-dealing friends got saved. And the first person I wanted to see after three weeks of reading this New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs, can you guess who it was? Mom. I wanted to see my little mama. So I got to her house. I knocked on the door. I got to mom and I said, Mom, Jesus spoke to me. And she went like this, get in here. She didn't say, welcome to the family. She didn't give me a decision card, nothing. She said, get in here, sit down, sit at the kitchen table. I sat down and she's, I said, Mom, Jesus spoke to me. She goes, what did he sound like? I said, oh, I don't know, Jesus, you sound like Jesus. And she said, what happened? She just started to grill me. I said, mom, it went through me, it was another voice. I said, I've been reading the Bible, mom. I said, I don't wanna do what I was doing before. And she looked at me, she said, Ben, your conscience is dead. You are a deep sinner. Do you realize you can't play games with this? You must really give yourself to God. And I said, you're right, mom, and I really want to. And I got down on my knees and I grabbed her precious little hands like this, precious little woman, and I said, forgive me, and I started bawling. Forgive me for what I have done. And she believed it then. And she prayed for me. And I went home that night. And I don't know if I prayed a sinner's prayer, a proper prayer. I can't even remember doing that. But what I remember doing is this. I began to read this every day and say, Jesus, you asked me to follow you. I will take that seriously. And I will become a disciple. The ones that you call your beloved. The ones that you call your true followers. You can give the Lord praise for that. Because if it wasn't for that night, if it wasn't for those moments, I wouldn't even be standing here with you today. I want to read one more verse to you. It's John chapter 3. You might have seen this also on American TV on Steph Curry's shoes or or many people, Gary Ablett Jr., you know, played, played for Geelong and for the Gold Coast Suns and all these amazing people who also love God. There's so, so many. Marky Mark, the guy, Mark Wahlberg, who was on the Gold Coast three weeks ago, he has this scripture all the time, uses it all the time. He's also a Christian. See, sometimes the world tells you Christians are weird. Or Christians are fruitcakes. Yeah, kind of we are a bit. But they're not weird. They're awakened. They're not weird. They have seen reality. I think it's weirder to live the double life that I lived, to live this manipulative life with so much brokenness and have to prop up a smile and snort up cocaine or inject Botox or whatever it might be that you need to do to make yourself feel valuable. I think it's weird to try and keep putting back together a broken vessel when God could give you a new one. And here's the reason God sent Jesus. It's on the screen. John Chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he made a dead religion. I'm going to try this side. For God so loved the world that he made a dead religion. Right? For God so loved the world that he made a book of rules. For God so loved the world that he thought the world sucked and he wanted to kill everybody. No. No. For God so loved the world, and the world is you tonight. It's you. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why a Son? Because He wanted to feel what you feel. God could have given, here's a prayer. It could have hung in the stars. Pray this and I'll forgive you. But He didn't do that. He gave a man so He could feel what you feel as a man. He put himself in human flesh so he could pay a price for our broken flesh. It says he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, say whoever. That means no matter where you came from, no matter what you did, whoever believes in him shall not perish 
but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Verse 17, God did not send His Son into the world. I'm going to say it one more time by faith. Verse 17. There you go. (laughs) For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. God didn't bring you here tonight to condemn you. God didn't bring you here tonight to go, you filthy person. He bring you here because He loves you. He brought you here because He knew you'd hear the message. He knew your way was like this, broken, up, down, no truth, some truth, broken truth. He knew that He could show you the way, that He could give you His truth. And they could bring you back to life because he is the life. And tonight he's your hope. He's the only one that can forgive sin because he's the only perfect person who ever walked the face of the planet and he defeated sin on his cross. I'll finish with this. Humanity is fractured. You heard tonight about a broken man. Put yourself in the story. Maybe money is your God. I'm only as valuable as what I have in my bank. Maybe it's another kind of sin. It's all the same. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. Have you ever met a person in the world who, who says, I've never made a mistake in my entire life. If we were to ever meet someone like that, we'd go, that was your first mistake. You just lied. <laughs> Every one of us has a shame thing in our past, has guilt because of sin. And there's no way to rid the guilt in your own strength. You need somebody to take it for you. You need someone perfect to carry what you did that was imperfect, where you fell short of the standards and the love and the life of God. Humanity is fractured, but you still believe there's value in you, don't you? You wouldn't go to the hospital, would you, to escape death if you didn't think you meant something If you didn't think that this body had more inside of it than just a shell, otherwise you go, yeah, I'm dying. Just don't even take me to the hospital. Yeah, my arm just got cut off. Don't put it back on. You don't do that. We scramble. We spend billions of dollars every year to fight for life because something inside the human heart cries, we're made for more. There is value. And you're so valuable, even though you sin even though you are guilty because you did sin against God, you're valuable enough to God thinks, for God to think that it's worth sending Jesus. Guys, I don't want anybody to move around right now, please. The only reason I don't, it's not because I want to control something, because people are going to start running down those aisles and because this is such a holy moment. We prayed, fasted, sought God, and I can tell you, if you had seen a picture of me, stranger, you're, we're friends now because you've heard my story, a lot about mine. Maybe I'll meet you later tonight and I'll hear a lot about yours. But I used to be kind of chubby and this event skinnied me. We did this whole thing, seeking the Lord for this very moment, for these moments. It's so important that we stay still just for three more minutes. You're worth something to God. And I'll finish with the, the, this. Give me one reason not to accept Jesus. Jesus as a person healed broken people continually. Jesus treated people with equality, man, woman, slave, free, Gentile, Jew. Every person that came to him, he treated with equality. Jesus healed sick people. He didn't condemn them and say how bad you are. He was a healer continually. Jesus had unreasonable love. He went beyond what any person would love. Even those who hated Him, when they hung Him on the cross, He said, Father, forgive them. His love was unreasonable. He was so, so deep in His love. He was perfect. He saw your imperfect life of sin. And yet He said, I will go to the cross for them. If they simply repent and believe in Me, they shall be saved they will be set free. And what does that mean? It means your dead spirit, your sin-filled spirit, once you repent of this, and repent isn't a bad word. What it means is this, you go, I'm walking this way and I'm sorry that I've hurt God, I've hurt myself, 
and I've surely hurt other people. My sins have cost people pain and the greatest pain was the cross. And you repent. God, I turn to you. That's what I did. God, make me a new creation. And Jesus loved you enough to go to that cross, to be crucified, to be whipped for you, even for those who would mock Him and hate Him and not take Him seriously. He said, forgive them. And tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is here and He wants to forgive you. Some of you pastors and leaders and other people around here might be like, wow, I've heard that message a million times. Some of you guys might be like, this is great, it's cool. You know, but you know, can I tell you something? I am never ever gonna get sick of the gospel. I will never get tired of the gospel. I'll tell you why. Because this book says, and I've seen it in my life and I've seen it in yours, it is the power of God unto salvation. It changes things. And tonight the Lord wants to help you. He wants to change you, but you've got to take the mask off and be real with God. So lastly, what does it mean to believe in God? Some of, you, some of you might be like, I believe in God. Yes, but even Satan believes in God. He's seen God. He believes in God more than you do. Believing God exists won't save you. When Jesus said, come to me and believe in me, what he's saying is this, believe in who I said I am. Believe in what I said I did. Believe in the cross. Believe in the Holy Spirit's power to change you and make you a child of God. Don't believe He exists. Believe he, everything He says is the truth. And tonight Jesus calls to you. He wants to give you a brand new life and a brand new heart. He sees you tonight. And it's the whole reason we put this event on. That He would be glorified. That He would have you in His heart for all eternity. Would you close your eyes? All over this venue, I would just ask Christians just to gently begin to pray. And if those who are sitting at the front here can move very fast. I don't know why we didn't move you, but I love your hunger. It's so beautiful. But we got to move really quick. Just go right over there. Just go right over there really, really fast. But the rest of you, just keep praying. Just run to your left and your right. Make space over those corners. Go really quick, guys. Really, really quick. Would everybody please close their eyes except those who are walking? Gently pray, just gently pray. If you know your life is far from God, that you don't have Jesus in your heart, that your sins have not been forgiven, that you are filling your life with things, that you are wasting it for bread that comes for one day and the next day you need more. You're empty inside. And you know, I've sinned against God. I don't want this anymore. I want to be free. If you know God tonight is calling out your name and saying to you, come and be forgiven. Come and be my child. Come and turn from your darkness. If you know that is you, take every mask off. Forget what anybody thinks of you and place your hand up if that is you right now. If you have backslidden away from God, you are a Christian and you're living a double life or you're a person who has never said yes to Jesus, and you know, I must say it tonight. I can feel, Ben, you are speaking straight to my heart. Then take the mask off. Who gives a rip what people think? Put your hand up as high as you can right now so I can see you. Place them up high. All our ushers, you need to see those guys right now. See them. Guys, quick, point to them where they are so we can see them. Point to them right now where they are. Is there anybody else? All the way up in the stands, all the way in the back. Don't miss this moment. Don't be afraid. Sometimes we sit there, we're like, what will everybody think of me? Guys, don't live for their opinion. Live for the truth. Give your life to Jesus. Set your soul free. I ask one more time. If you're here, the Lord Jesus is calling you with His loving arms. He's saying, come home, Sarah. Come home, Luke. Come home. If you know you want Jesus in your life tonight, if you've backslidden as a Christian, if you're living a double life of compromise and you've never really made Him the Lord of your life, or if you have never given Jesus your heart, this is your first time, or even it's from 20 years ago, and tonight you know God is calling you, place your hand up without any fear. Put your hand up very, very high. 
Put it up very, very high so we can see. Okay, all of those with their hand up and their friends next to them, stand up fast as you can. And their friends next to them, stand up as quick as you can. Come on, guys, give them a hand. Come on, fast as you can, stand up. And all the friends, family members that bought them, stand up with them. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. Even in the stands, turn to them. If you're a Christian friend, say, come on, stand up. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. If that is you, I want to invite you. I want to personally pray for you. All of you guys standing, your friends will come with you. Come to the front. We're going to pray for you right now. Come on, guys. Let's celebrate. This is the reason Jesus died on the cross. Come. Come. Come to the mercy of Jesus. We'll wait for you all the way in the back. (laughs) Come on, church, we can do better than that. Praise the Lamb of God. Keep coming. They're coming from everywhere. Praise the Lamb of God. Keep coming. Hey, sweetheart, God bless you. Hey, sweetheart, Jesus loves you. This night, God knew He'd meet you this very night. Look, he put all this on just so he could get to you. Keep coming, guys. Come on, keep shouting, keep praising. This is your new family members.